Dennis Judd so that he can present on our um, on his presentation on his trip this past summer. Um, and I'm going to spotlight him so that everyone can see him only. Um, so, um, Dennis, take All it right, away. Right. Okay, uh, let me. Uh, well, I'll do a little intro first. I'll put the screen share on right now. Make sure that's working. Uh, Chris, do you have to uh, enable the screen share? You should be able to do that. It says host disabled, attending, attendee screen sharing, kind of a global thing it looks like. All right, let me un cancel the spotlight. There we go. Try it now. Okay. It still says disabled. There we go. There we are. Okay, let me pop to this. Okay, can everybody see that? Yep. Okay, good, that's right, you're the only one I can hear. <laughs> okay, well, clearly it's great to be here with you folks. Um, and I'm sorry this has to be by Zoom, but I'm glad at least that we can do it. So uh, we've got that going for us, which is great. Um, if we were able to do this at Savin Hill, I really kind of wanted it to be more of a dialogue, but like uh, Chris said, we'll do the best we can with the chat box. So if you have any questions at all as we go forward, just put them in the chat box and we'll, we'll deal with them. So to any folks who um, read my uh, four-part um, piece, the pieces that went out in January to April, uh, some of this is gonna look pretty familiar, but hopefully uh, there'll be some little bit, di diving a little bit more deeply into some of the issues, uh, which hopefully will be fun. Um, just a little bit about me, for those of you who are new to the club or didn't make, um, weren't at the presentation that my wife and I did a couple of years ago at Savin Hill. Um, I started sailing young as a kid, I uh, was in the Coast Guard. Um, Heidi sailed a lot when she was young and then we both, um, we met and then we did some more sailing together and then went down to um, Virginia where we went off on our first big blue water passage down to Tortola with the Caribbean 1500 in 2011. And from there we went down to Grenada and back up and around and sailed over to Panama and spent a season in the San Blas Islands and went through the canal and then over to uh, French Polynesia, from Galapagos, French Polynesia. And then uh, I sailed with some friends up from uh, Tahiti up there, up to Hawaii and then Alaska. And then Heidi and I came back down the inside passage. Uh, done several other passages on other people's boats, um, uh, Fiji to New Zealand and out in the Med and uh, Tortola to Bermuda a couple of times. So while well, I haven't been all the way around, <laughs> I got a few miles under my keels, so that's been that's been a blast. Um, so um, this is a wavelength. This is the boat that we did our passage on. Uh, it's a 1983 Cherubini uh, 44 cutter rigged catch. Uh, she sails beautifully. Four uh, white sails, two nylon light air sails. Um, and that prior picture, by the way, at that at the first slide was actually wavelength um, as we were crossing the equator on the way to the Galapagos because uh, we buddy boated together for all of those years to French Polynesia. So I knew this guy, he knew me and, and that made it all work out really, really well. So um, this, uh, here she is at the dock in Darwin waiting for us to do some projects. Uh, we got those done, we did some provisioning and um, at, at some point we thought we were all set and we were ready to roll. Now, these are the Moscow mules, the, the new boat drink. So uh, that was that was fun. Ready to say our goodbyes. And like I said, we just thought we had all the projects done. Uh, we did a good job. We fixed the autopilot, um, fixed, uh, replaced some chain plates for the aft stays for the main mast, and a bunch of other odds and ends. And then did our provisioning. Um, and believe it or not, I'm sure many of you have seen this kind of scene in your own boat for a long trip but everything ultimately finds a, a, whole, a place to, uh, to be put away and the cabin was clean again. So that was, that was great. 
And so finally we got all our stuff done. We said our goodbyes, had our last Moscow mules and uh, took off through the canal. It's actually a single lock uh, out of this marina into the Timor Sea. Uh, there's quite the tidal range outside the gates. Uh, so it keeps all the, the, the kind of water levels manageable inside and probably keeps out the crocs too, which is, which is always a good thing in the sharks. So this is sort of the overview of the journey. Um, you can see way over there, Darwin on the right, then Ashmore Reef, Cocos, and then over to Reunion, down under Madagascar, uh, over to Richards Bay, and then uh, around Cape Agulhas, uh, otherwise known as the Cape of Storms, uh, up to Cape Town. So those are the, the three pieces I'm going to try to kind of focus on today. Um, not a travelogue approach, but just kind of what we went through on the general generalized Indian Ocean experience, um, crossing the Agulhas Current, which was uh, one of our big anxieties or anticipations, and then getting around the Cape of Storms. Um, so let me just get this up here. So these were the legs, um, just briefly Darwin to Ashmore, you know, four or five days, four days, Ashmore to Cocos, 1500 miles, uh, took us 10 days and Cocos to Reunion was the, the biggest chunk, uh, 2450, that was 16 days, Reunion to Richards Bay was only 1400, that took us 10 days and then the, the, the most frustrating piece was getting around to the Cape, only 880 miles, but took us like 11 days, six days of sailing. So uh, it was quite, and I'll talk more about that later, of course. So we finally um, get going. So the Indian Ocean um, in general, I mean, anybody who has done a circumnavigation or has contemplated it, um, in the Indian Ocean appears to be, or consistently is um, projected as the, the part of the passage that is the most difficult. Um, you get beat up the most on this one. So we were expecting the worst. We were expected to get, you know, bad weather, big seas, lots of squalls, uh, get thrown around the boat a lot. Um, but it was by and large a, an amazing experience. Um, we had lots of days like this. Um, this was the, mm. the, um, uh, the green sail in the foreground is the mizzen staysail. And that other blue and yellow sail in the background is the drifter, which we only used like a couple of times, but we used that mizzen staysail a lot. That was a great sail, but we had great days like that and like this, and we had nights like this. It's just beautiful out there. And you know, we sure we had some of our, you know, some bad weather. We had a few squalls here and there. Um, I kind of call them squalls light. Uh, they weren't anything like the Caribbean squalls. Um, uh, and nothing like what Heidi and I experienced on our way from the Galapagos to the Marquesas. But, you know, they let us know they were there. And um, we had, you know, our, a couple of dreary days coming and going, but, you know, that's what you, that's what you get and that's what you're ready for. Uh, had some decent sized seas, mostly in the four to eight range, but they were sometimes up to 12 feet and 15, you know, sometimes, but they were almost always off the quarter. So it was a lot of fun. Um, it was uh, not a bad, we had some rolly conditions uh, sometimes, certainly. It made for some odd, uncomfortable boat motion with the wind and waves aft or mostly aft. There was a lot of, uh, a lot of rolling, as you can imagine. Sometimes it got to be just a little, a little much. Um, we had, I was, I was going to say prior to this slide that uh, you know, I keep talking about how what a milk run this kind of passage, this not kind, this particular passage was for us, for the timing and, and the way it all worked out. But uh, jumping forward a little bit, we did have um, some miserable weather for a, a day or two. Um, actually, had to put on my real fallies. Um, my wife Heidi was uh, keeping us advised of, you know, we'd get our gribs and stuff, you know, all the time, but she was keeping us apprised of. Uh, this any crazy stuff that was coming up and this is an event where there was some significant lightning coming our way and we were coming from the upper right portion of the screen uh, kind of diagonally down to the southwest and uh, she was advising us to try to move a little bit more north of west because there was a current south set current that was pushing us down towards the system but um, fortunately we missed it and this is her text to me 
<laughs> that yay, you missed it, and, but there's some nasty stuff coming. But we got out of the worst of it, which was really nice. But anyway, back to these little, you know, the seas, the rolling waves. Um, we were getting slapped around a good bit um, at the beginning. Beautiful weather, like, you know, clear skies or maybe one eight or two eight in terms of clouds. Um, but every once in a while, we would get slammed on the, usually the windward side. But one time we got whacked with a big wave somehow on the, the lee side and it bashed through, not broke, but it worked its way around the port light in Mark's uh, bunk. Uh, so this is all of his bedding trying to uh, get dry. You know how it is trying to dry salt water soaked fabrics. <laughs> uh, it, was, um, it was challenging. And my yellow jacket was there because uh, the waves brashing in on the, on the windward side, they would often just work their way through the gasket on the port light. And I was just keeping my jacket there to keep it off my, my mattress. And when the, uh, this, this boat has a uh, kind of a, a very low freeboard aft. And so it's very easy for the waves to splash into the cockpit. And this is kind of where we were always tucked in on the, the you know, port of the starboard side, right under the Dodger, right against that bulkhead by the companionway. And when the weather got really wet in there, which it did a lot, actually, uh, we were actually up, hunkered down, up, you know, or crouched in with that winch up there, with our legs hanging out in the companionway or sitting in the companionway. It was uh, a very wet cockpit, I must say. The boat sailed beautifully, but it was a wet cockpit. Of course, with those uh, waves that we had off the quarter, we get some good surfing opportunities. So I don't know if you can see that glare, but that's 11.9 uh, knots going down one of those waves, <laughs> which was kind of fun. Um, so in terms of our communications, uh, there were two prime pieces of equipment that we used for 99% of our communications. The Iridium Go, I'm sure many of you have uh, have this or experience this, but it's just an amazing piece of kit. Um, it allows you to get uh, emails. Um, you can um, uh, download the, the grids, the, the weather maps. You can um, text back and forth with other people on other, well, anybody that you can talk to on a phone. You can use the satellite phone system through this with your uh, smartphone. So it's just an amazing, amazing uh, little piece of equipment. Um, the only thing that we, you know, we had that and then my inReach was the other, the other piece of equipment that we used a lot. Uh, let me get back to that for a second. Um, but the inReach is a device that many of you also might be familiar with. Um, it's, it was uh, created by DeLorme, but then Garmin quickly bought it when they realized how good it was. A small little device, actually I'll go to that slide. This little device, um, that allow also through the Iridium system, and it allows you to uh, have back and forth communications, 160 character texts. And the real cool thing is that it just, you can, um, it plots your position on the map and it broadcasts it out to all those, not broadcast it, but it puts it on a, on a website that your friends and family can look at and see right where you are within four hours of, of real time. Uh, you can change the frequency down to like 10 minutes, but on a passage, four hours is, is short. I'd rather have them like have six or 12. But the blue um, little symbols on there are outgoing texts. The greens are incoming text. And this green happens to be here from one of our buddy boats that also had an in rate. So we're able to communicate back and forth. You can get a quick little weather update, uh, either from your shore team or from a weather router or just a, a, a marine weather forecast. So it's, uh, it's a great, great piece of uh, equipment there too. Cheap, um, just worth its weight in gold. Um, this, you know, I was talking about gribs a second ago, uh, getting the gribs, uh, we got them twice a day. This is, many of them sure have predict wind and you've, you're very familiar with these, um, these uh, kinds of downloads, but this one shows the, uh, the wind barbs and directions and uh, pressures, uh, atmospheric pressures. And GRIBS, as I'm sure also both, most, most of you know, stands for Gridded Information in Binary Format. And basically what that is, is um, uh, just raw computer 
output with no human uh, kind of interpretation or intervention. So it's just raw data. So it's mostly good. It's, it's very good in, in the, the coarse grained scheme of things. Um, uh, we never, um, we, we kind of gave up using the routing component of this predict wind. We just got weather and sometimes currents, but it was really, really great uh, communications thing. So the other piece that we used a good bit, of course, is the AIS transceiver. Um, amazing, uh, comforting to be able to have, uh, to know, you know, if there's a close CPA, closest point of approach that was closer than we wanted to deal with or needed to make some, you know, maneuvers to avoid. Uh, it also gave us the opportunity to um, uh, talk to the bridge of these big boats. And in this case, we've got a thousand foot cargo ship coming down on us. And we're able to talk to the bridge and you coordinate what we're doing, what they're doing. And I was always amazed at how, um, how accommodating these folks are in these really big boats. You know, occasionally it doesn't work, but most of the time it did. And then after talking with these guys and uh, knowing that you're safe, it's still a little bit unnerving to uh, cross the bow of, of somebody like that. Even when all of your instruments are saying it's cool, it still gives you pause. Uh, daily routines. Um, this is what we did every day. Uh, sail management, of course, responding to the wind, uh, the changing winds and, and our, any new waypoints that we have to change direction. Um, we spent a lot of time with just the Genoa because we almost had all these winds off the quarter, the southeast trades. Uh, a lot of time with just a Genoa a sheet run through a block at the end of the boom and the mizzen staysail. And that was probably 80% of our sail plan. And it worked out great. Uh, watches were, uh, when there are three of us, uh, we did um, uh, three on, six off, which I really like. Uh, it makes the, it's very not, it's very, uh, keeps the interest up, I think, for me, uh, because it takes three days to go through a complete um, cycle of watches. And to me, three on is nice because it's just enough and you're ready to get off watch and you can. And six hours off has always proved to be plenty. Uh, some people like four on, eight off, which I guess for short, um, you know, hops, you know, would work great. Uh, the downside for me is that you got the same watch every day and every night. Um, but it does give you that extra two hours off, but it's an extra hour on. So it's a trade off. And if you have to put on, you know, a lot of like serious foulies, you know, put them on and take them off before and after every watch, uh, it might be, it might make sense. Some people really, you know, prefer that, but I like three on six off. When there's two of us, uh, when Heidi and I did a lot of passages and with, when at the end of this particular journey, we had just two of us, uh, we do five, four, three, which is five on, five off, four on, four off, three on and three off. And it's a 24 hour cycle. So granted you have the same watches, but uh, it just makes time go quickly and it gives you uh, a five hour time off to hopefully get one good four hour chunk of sleep. Uh, to me, it's very important to get, um, to be one of the most important tasks off watch is to, is to be, uh, to get rested and, and keep your mind fresh and clear. Meal prep was uh, kind of based on watches. Whoever had a certain watch made dinner and whoever had another watch cleaned up after dinner. Uh, we quickly went from three meals a day to two meals a day because the third meal always ended up being too late at night and dark. So we said, let's have a nice breakfast and uh, an early dinner and then you snack for the rest of the time. And that worked out really, really well. Um, Every day, of course, rig checks, chafe checks, uh, and it's remarkable how much chafing happens on a long passage. It's just endless. Um, we've had several times where we had to replace halyards and, and furling lines, and it's just ongoing. So you got to just keep doing that every day. We make water every couple of days uh, and managing the batteries kind of simultaneously with that. Uh, we had lots of solar panels, so we didn't have to do, you know, we were able to stay on top of that pretty well, but every day or two, we'd have to start the motor, uh, pop, top up the batteries, and whenever we did that, we'd make water because it was a great opportunity to do that. Now, of course, we're fishing um, and sometimes had some luck. And then again, as I said before, sleeping is a very important piece of being off watch. Uh, and then getting grips two times a day, every morning and every night, we got grips. So that was every day, 
this is basically what we did. And so we got a couple of fish, a couple of Dorado, nice little tuna. And um, so as part of this, you know, general ocean, uh, Indian Ocean piece, uh, we of course did, a, as you may have read in my um, little installments, uh, we had that first uh, stopover after four days in Ashmore Reef. And this was just a really nice, quick little stop, two nights, one day, checked, we had to replace a, um, uh, halyard for the Genoa, um, and the Australian Border Police, Border Patrol met us at the entrance. They escorted us to a proper mooring ball. It's a national park, uh, but it, that was at low tide, what you're seeing there. Um, at high tide, you can barely even see this thing. So coming around in a boat, you're not even sure you're there until you're there. You just gotta trust your charts. And this was our first real time off. Uh, this was at Coco's Keeling. Um, I keep saying when, when I see this slide, it's called like the, a day in the life in the lagoon. Uh, this, is, this is what it looked like every day. Well, some days there was a little wind chop through there because it did get windy occasionally. But this was our anchorage. Uh, the, on the right side of the slide is Direction Island. And this archipelago has five islands. Horsburg Island at the end, at the top of the little the whole four other islands create like a large U and then Horsburg Island is at the top and you can get in on the east side, the northeast in, and if everything is right and your boat specs are good, you can get out uh, to the northwest, but typically people go out to the northeast and back around Horsburg Island to leave. But we've got Direction Island on the right and that's where we all had to anchor. We weren't allowed to go past there, uh, none of our boats. Um, and then around, you know, clockwise around kind of to the right, back right corner was Home Island, no, yeah, Home Island, which was home to about 400 Muslim community. And then around beyond that was at the base was South Island, which is uninhabited. And then coming up around the west side was West Island, which is where the Aussies lived and about 45 of them that lived there met kids. And that's where the, there's a little hotel and that's where the airport is. So um, a little bit more um, of what you'd expect in a, you know, a stopover uh, that you'd want to go to. Um, but it was, it was an absolutely paradise place. Uh, looked like this just all the time. And that I think, yeah, down in the, in the back, kind of right side of the slide in the back is, is Home Island. Um, and along the way on these kinds of passages, any circumnavigation or any other long, well, mostly circumnavigations, um, even if you're only doing pieces of them, you end up at these places where everybody else uh, goes. And what the tradition is, is that um, you put up a plaque that uh, kind of has the name of your boat and the year you were there and sometimes a crew. So this is the crew of uh, a 50 foot Maxi, Max 50, Maxi 50 German family, a father and daughter uh, sailing, putting up their plaque. I think they had one crew. So that's probably the three of them putting up their plaque for their contribution. And I just got this slide in there to show you what that little pavilion looks like with all the plaques kind of hanging all around. <laughs> and it's uh, really just a fun um, tradition and experience. And you meet lots of people from all over the world at these places. Uh, we first arrived at uh, Cocos Keeling and there were like three boats, these two, well, there's two boats for these French folks, one couple and three, three men, on another boat. And, um, and there were one, it's like one or two other boats, a big German catamaran and, and maybe one, one else. Uh, and then soon after we arrived, uh, we were trying to, st all this whole way, we were trying to stay ahead of the World Ark folks uh, because they chew up services and, and just like clog up things when they come through. So we were always trying to stay a little bit ahead of them. So by the time we were here for about th two or three days, 17 ARC boats came in and we were feeling a little bit intruded upon, but um, actually it was fun because we met a lot of really cool folks. But these French guys, um, we, we, the only, it was two places to get any food. You have to take a ferry from, or you, or you row or you swim to Home Island to a, a grocery store, quote unquote. Um, and get some provisions there. And the fresh vegetables are probably two weeks old by the time they get to that marketplace. Um, 
but anyway, no pork, Muslim community, so no pork and no alcohol. So these guys, we had um, hours to kill because we had to take a ferry from Direction Island, as I said, to get, but it only goes once a day. It goes once in the morning and then four or five hours later, you take it back. It only happens like one day a week or maybe two days a week, I forget. So that's where we did a good chunk of canned provisioning. <laughs> Uh, but these guys bought a bunch of sausages and rolls, and then Michelle went and bought um, um, a couple of bottles of uh, non-alcoholic wine, and we just had some fun here um, having a barbecue waiting for the ferry to come back. And the funny thing here is that one of the policemen came by, and he was very kind of concerned that we were cooking non cooking pork sausages. And if, if we were, we'd have to like scrub and clean this grill to leave the island. Uh, but we assured them that we bought it on the island, so everything was uh, everything was good. Um, I Quick forgot question. to mention. Dennis, yeah. What yeah. are the Ark boats? What are they? Uh, the World Ark. It's the um, uh, it's the uh, world. It's it's basically a circumnavigation run by the World Cruising Club, um, and they have a rally around the world. They they. They've taken over the Caribbean 1500 now from the um, Steve Black who started it many years ago. So now they're running that, um, but they have been doing this world arc thing where you pay like a good chunk of change and they kind of escort you in and um, arrange for stopovers at all these different places around the world. It takes about 18 months in their format to get around once. It became so popular now that I think instead of starting every other year, they start now every year and they just have this kind of rotating you know, cycle of boats going around the world. So um, I forget exactly what ARC stands for. Um, Atlantic it's Atlantic Rally, it's Atlantic Atlantic Rally, Rally for, for cruises. cruisers. That's right. And that's who they are. So they start out with like, I don't know, um, Craig, maybe you do know, 25, uh, 50 or more boats by the time they get this far, there's only like a handful. Um, and some people will uh, go just to French Polynesia and hang there for a year. Then they'll go to Fiji and hang there for a year or two. People love Fiji. Um, so you can kind of jump on and off the train uh, as, you, as you want around the world. So that's who they are. And uh, when they are organized, so the, all the services know they're coming. So as soon as they started arriving, and we all know that after big passages, there's lots of fixes to be done. They just uh, have kind of prearranged priority for the ARC boats. So you gotta get in before they come so you can get some services and get some projects completed, which we'll talk about in a little bit at Reunion Island. Uh, so just more camaraderie, uh, meeting folks. And this is still at uh, Direction Island in Cocos. Um, big, these French guys caught a huge fish and we just all ate together that night. It was just a lot of fun. So after um, eight beautiful days uh, at this paradise, uh, it was time to leave. And uh, while we were there, we had met this uh, other boat, this Trintella 57, a family circumnavigating, not in the ark, just on their own. Um, and they were leaving around the same time we were, so we agreed to kind of buddy boat. So we took off together um, and we were actually in visible, visual sight of each other for the entire passage until they ducked off to the Southwest to go to Rodriguez after 2000 miles together. Uh, so it was really comforting. Um, being out in the middle of the ocean is um, humbling uh, when there's nothing around you for hundreds and hundreds of miles, maybe a thousand, um, but it's also wonderful. But when you have another boat really nearby, it just, it adds a little bit of comfort. They actually had a situation where they had to replace a uh, sheet for their Genoa. So they um, uh, hove to, you know, it's maybe a day or so out and they hove to, we just kind of, you know, pulled in all our sails and kind of hung around and waited for them. When they got going again, we put our sails back up and we take off together. It was, it was really, really great. Um, <clears throat> So um, on that passage, uh, after 2,300 plus miles uh, with that, well, actually he dropped off maybe 100 miles or so behind us right at this point, but this is just rounding the top of Mauritius. And this was going to be our next big land hoe 
um, experience. Uh, but as we approached, we realized we had some fixes we had to do to that autopilot that we thought we fixed effectively in Darwin, but clearly had not. It wasn't up to the stresses uh, that it was experiencing. So <clears throat> we had to do some more work. So we were on the phone before we arrived in Mauritius trying to arrange for services because of what I was saying about the ARC. We wanted to make sure we had like an appointment to get this, um, uh, get our, our autopilot fixed. And we couldn't, we had no luck getting anybody. So we said, all right, screw it. We'll uh, start talking to folks in reunion. And we finally got a um, uh, hold of a couple of services in reunion. So we said, all right, it's a bad, it's unfortunate, but we're gonna skip Mauritius. There's a timing issue there. <clears throat> skip Mauritius and go to directly to reunion to get that uh, autopilot piece done. So we had to postpone our land hoe. And so the next day, this is, uh, this is actually the next, the morning after the next day, because we arrived that next day and had to heave to uh, right outside the island on the northwest shoulder of the island, right around outside the harbor entrance. Uh, we probably could have gone in, but the harbor master told us to please wait until daylight. So we did. We were good doobies. And, um, so this was just a beautiful, uh, beautiful, and well, beautiful island and a great experience, which I'll talk about in just a second. But we were hove to out here at the night before, and another big uh, close CPA came along. Like, and when I say close, it's like point one on one side, on port side, and then point four on the starboard side, then point three on the port side. So it's pretty much dead on. So we talked to that guy, and it was like a nine hundred some odd foot cargo ship and I told them um, we are drifting we're not under control right now uh, well he didn't quite put it that way so we're drifting not no motor going we're not sailing he said okay no worries I'll um, I'll just go off 10 degrees and go around you I'll leave you plenty of room so again it was just a uh, very comforting anyway this was the damaged piece of autopilot equipment I get you can see my mouse I think um, this, the beam went all the way back, right back underneath that, the underside of that deck. Uh, so what we had done was we had epoxied and six inch lag bolted this thing in place. We thought that was good enough. Uh, apparently it wasn't. Michelle and I, Michelle was the other crew. And I apologize. I didn't introduce him as effectively as, as I should have before. Uh, he and I sailed a lot together. Um, uh, his, him on buddy boating me on his boat and him on, on my boat. Um, so we all knew each other very, very well. So anyway, Michelle and I are out a little walkabout. We just had gotten in. We wanted to like stretch our legs, go have a beer. And we're sitting at this nice little brasserie and we get a text from Mark saying, damage is worse than expected. Please come back right away. <laughs> and this is what we were looking at. So we had to get this thing fixed. So we arranged for some services, found a metal fabricating place, had them create these angle beams for us. Uh, I think it's like uh, four mil material and they made them into these angle irons and they drilled holes, uh, the smaller holes that we could um, put them uh, like fastened to the underside of the deck and these through bolts, these through holes here where we could then sandwich that beam uh, to itself and to the beam and to these angle irons. And this piece of wood here is a replacement for this old piece right there. So we're able to find a woodworker to make this, the metal worker to make all this, and then we finish the project and it is solid as a rock now. Uh, we initialed it and Mark's little um, note here is this project sucked. And Mark was the owner of the boat, but it's, uh, it was a two times effort and a lot of hours on this one, but finally it's good. But this is Reunion Island. It's a volcanic, volcanic island. It's absolutely stunning. Um, just amazing landscape. Uh, and it ha it's very volcanic and it actually has an active volcano <laughs> going on the island. And I couldn't drive all the way around the island because the south end was closed because this lava flow, they were concerned it was gonna go actually across the road. Um, it, I don't think it ever did really but it was pretty interesting. It wasn't like Kilauea Iki, but you know, it was pretty fun. 
So uh, eight wonderful days again at uh, Reunion, now we're off. Uh, now it's just Mark and I at this point. Uh, we lost Michelle at, the, at Reunion. He uh, jumped ship and went to another boat for a lot of kind of, as you can maybe have experienced or can imagine, um, crew dynamics can be sometimes a challenge. And it turns out that Michelle and Mark kind of butted heads a good bit and it got to the point where Mark, I mean, Michelle just said, I'm out of here. So we tried sort of to get a third crew in reunion, but uh, we really both felt it was going to be fine just the two of us to take off on this boat. We felt that autopilot fix was, um, you know, really going to hold. And that was really the only big issue. Uh, weather is, you know, we can deal with most of whatever comes that way. But so we take off and this is where we're now um, heading for uh, the real, what I call the first of the two cruxes of this whole passage. Now the Indian Ocean, as I said, this, you're supposed to get beat up, but you know, you get beat up and you get thrown around the saloon and the and cockpit and that's what happens. Um, you know, we're always doing this in seasons that are predictably manageable, not cyclone seasons and hurricane seasons. So you get beat up a little bit, but the Agolas current is a big deal. And then getting around the Cape of Storms is a big deal. And they're both really because of the Agolas current and the weather systems down there. So this black line is our rough uh, passage. It's not exactly, I just kind of winged it in, uh, not trying to chart it out. But you, we're coming down southwest uh, and then coming right along um, south latitude uh, 26 uh, west for several days and then start working our way down towards um, toward uh, Richards Bay, which is right at the end of that black line right there. Um, so uh, Michelle had sent out, I think it was um, last December, uh, a kind of a copy of the memo that Des, our weather router, um, and I'll talk about him in a second, uh, sends out to everybody that is coming down this neck of the woods and explains how uh, treacherous it can be with southwest winds coming up against a southwest set current fierce winds and a very significant current um, creates, I think it's been recorded, 20 meter waves. I mean, like 60 foot high, stand, not standing waves, but almost standing waves, just nasty stuff. You don't want to be around any of that. And it's because of the constant lows, strong lows coming up uh, through here. So I hope you had a chance to read that one, um, but it's, uh, it was very sobering for us. By the way, Dennis, um, Alec was asking why you did not stop in Madagascar. Um, mostly because of timing. Uh, we didn't stop in Madagascar because uh, there's two ways people tend to go around this piece of the passage. If you have more time, you go to uh, Rodriguez or Mauritius or Reunion, and then you go up around the top of Madagascar and spend like a couple of months around there, Nosy B and these other places that are supposed to be absolutely beautiful. But that's going to add like a month to six weeks uh, to this whole passage. Um, <clears throat> would have required leaving way earlier than we did. Um, I would have loved to have gone there, absolutely. Uh, but one of the conditions uh, for me joining Mark was that we had to do the express route because I was not willing to take five or six months to do this. Um, so I said, if you, if you want me to join you and I'd love to do it. And if you don't, if you don't, if you want to take the long route and you find somebody else, it's fine. I'm not, I'm not gonna hurt my feelings, but if we do, if I help you, we need to do the express route. So that was kind of the deal. I thought doing the passage a was going to be amazing. Stopping anywhere along the way was going to be just gravy. And then South Africa was just the icing on the cake. So for me, it was all good. So anyway, this is the, the general trend at the south you know, part of the world here. Uh, around the southwest and southeast sides of South Africa, of the African continent, these two highs uh, just kind of migrate you know, around here, you know, east and west and east and west. 
And between these two highs, and remember that in the south southern hemisphere, uh, the Coriolis is, you know, has the opposite effect in terms of you know, cyclonic activity. So highs are actually counterclockwise here, uh, and then lows are clockwise. So what happens is you get these big highs coming through here, and, the, and these lows kind of generate right in between these two, and they come rocketing up the coast. And this is little remnants of one right here. You can see that kind of clockwise cyclonic activity. And this is what creates havoc. We got the southwest winds coming up against that north and that southwest set current. <coughs> that creates the nasty stuff. So you got to watch what's going on here. These lows can come up every day, every couple of days. Uh, so that's why it's so important to uh, get the, the uh, kind of the local knowledge about what's happening here. And, and that's a good point to bring back up the Des Kaysen uh, thing. This man is the, basically the guru that everybody uses to get from Malaysia and Australia to South Africa. He's not a bona fide weatherman, but he is very knowledgeable uh, of weather and can read all the synoptic charts and understand what all the patterns are and, what, and all of that. And he's an ex-cruiser, so he knows what we're facing. So he... Uh, was guiding us in and we started his instructions started right around here about 700 miles from our destination setting us up so anyway this is what we're, we're trying to avoid dealing with so does uh, as i just said right at the end south end of madagascar he's now saying okay um, this happens to be on november 4th but on november 2nd we arrived i think on the uh, the eighth, I think it was, I forget. Um, starts setting us up. This is like, you know, just go 26 uh, latitude 270. Uh, and, you know, I'll let you know when you need to do something else. So we do that for a couple of days and then he starts giving us some more instructions. And the basic uh, instructions, I'm going to read this because it's, um, it's, very interesting and clear. The, the strategy to get across this current uh, was, it was like in four basic steps. You approach the edge of the current with a northerly wind, but you stay outside, well outside of the current and, and east of 34 east. And then you find a good spot in this particular case, this is all around the weather patterns you saw coming. So there was gonna be some dead air coming and you want us to get to a place in that pocket of dead air and heave to. And then right when this, the front below the dead air came up to the northeast and brought with it like 25 plus knot winds, um, we were still hove to, he says, when the winds start to settle down a little bit, let me know and then we can start our trajectory to the you know, west-northwest and then arcing down to the west-southwest. Um, and as the wind then, as you get closer to the current, and this, we're, so we're now, we're waiting for the system to come through. We've got south winds at 25 knots coming through, and we're still outside the current, and now they're gonna start backing a little bit to the south, southeast and southeast and then east, southeast, and they're gonna be diminishing. So as that happens, he wants us to be in this spot to scoot, you know, to get us across the current when there was uh, benign weather conditions um, and plenty of time to make it all happen. So that was the, 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 the charge. So this was the setup. Uh, just a, a little bit southwest around here, uh, we actually hove to and we're waiting for things to happen. We still had some nice northerly winds. So then this um, area of dead wind is working its way up toward us. And we found a place to heave to, like right in here. And then we're like, right there is where we hove to. And then these uh, 25 knot winds come through right on schedule. And then as they started uh, diminishing, we started heading ourselves to the northwest, west northwest. And then everything just kind of fell apart. And we ended up um, just kind of motoring in. Uh, and it was kind of, uh, well, let me just go to this next one first here. So this was our actual track. 
uh, we jibed, we're coming down from here and we jibed uh, to get ourselves over to this position. So we had to jibe here, jibe again, and then find our spot that we had picked a waypoint to heave to. And as so we drifted about one knot in this direction, the winds came through and we started sailing and we had a, uh, like a waypoint up over here somewhere that we were heading toward. But as we got to 34 East, uh, he said we'd start to experience some of that current and we'd start to feel the effects of it pushing us a little bit to the south. So we didn't want to be too far south to, un to get below this point. This is our destination. And we didn't want to get too, too high and count on the current to bring us down and it might not get us there and we'd just have to like chase ourselves down to, to get to Richards Bay. Uh, but it all worked just absolutely beautifully. And I think as I said to Michelle way back, it was like, um, was this all overhyped or did we just do everything right? I mean, all the planning and everything just ended up with this, like you're outside of Boston, you ran out of wind, you have to motor back into the harbor. Uh, there was no, no seas, no winds, just like motoring in. I think this is a very non-event, but we're still very grateful that we did everything the way we did. So it was a non-event. Um, so anyway, that, that worked out really, really well. Um, and this is something else I was gonna say there, but it'll come back to me. So anyway, we, <laughs> we finally see land and now we're really excited because this is like South Africa now. This is not just an island along the way. This is like the big deal. Um, we finally made it to this place. And we got onto the International Wall in Richards Bay. And the next morning, we wake up to this little monkey on our deck jumping off after scrounging around for some you know, leftovers that he was looking for, whatever. Um, it's like, you know you're in Africa when <laughs> you wake up and there's a monkey on your deck. Anyway, Richards Bay was kind of a, uh, a great place to uh, wait out our next um, our next uh, kind of challenge to get down around the Cape of Storms. Um, let me just see where this is going here. Oh, well, I'll come back to that. Uh, part of that document that Michelle sent around was explaining why it's so difficult to get around the Cape of Storms. And I talked about the weather aspect of it, but the other piece is that from Richards Bay, most people go to Richards Bay because it's much more pleasant to hang around in if you have to wait as long as we did uh, to get out of there to start heading south. Durban is supposed to be a real pain for customs and not a very pleasant place to hang out. It's about 85 miles south of Richards Bay, but Richards Bay is the preferred place. So to get out of there with those lows coming up like every day or two, um, and sometimes they'll they'll go on to land and they'll just kind of hide, then they'll pop back out again. You don't really know until it's already happening. So you really gotta be careful. So um, that was uh, part of why that's difficult is that leaving Richards Bay, and yes, you can stop at Durban if you want, but nobody wants to. So it's 330 miles with no shelter at all down the coast. And you've got to, um, uh, you got to make it and you don't want to get caught with southwest winds against that current um, so you just and that's why it's so tricky um, anyway so before so you take Bay, off where, what, what, what is the international wall oh that's just what they call it it's the wall where you come in to check in uh, you, you tie up there you, you got your quarantine flag up and you deal with customs and there's several different places to go <clears throat> Uh, there's like five different stops. Sometimes they come, some of them come to you and you have to go to others. But while you're uh, going through that process, you're supposed to be hanging out on this uh, international wall. And that's just what they call it. This was a harbor. I think I don't have that slide anymore. I took it out of, this was a big kind of U-shaped harbor uh, where all these boats came in and some people just said, you know, you don't have to move. The, the, the protocol is you come in, you check in, then you move to another place off the wall. But nobody was worrying about that. We were all rafted up, at least two boats. Well, not us mostly because we were in odd shape and had stuff. But uh, most of these boats were rafted up at least two deep. Um, and we were just all hanging out and partying and having a lot of fun. Um, 
The other thing that Des says in his memo is he allots 21 days to get from Richards Bay to uh, Cape Town. We thought, man, maybe two weeks, but 21 days, okay, we get it. Now that we understand what we're dealing with. We were here for 17 days before we could even leave. Um, anyway, I'll come back to that. Anyway, Richards Bay is a place um, where there's lots of opportunities for safaris, uh, game reserve areas and stuff outside. So I took advantage of all of that. It's just a lot of fun. I won't go into any detail there, but it was a blast. I saw three of the big five and a whole bunch of other stuff. But um, back to Des, he, uh, 21 days is what he says you should a lot. This year, he said, it has been a really funky year. Uh, these lows were not behaving quite as, as they typically do. But, you know, we made the best of our time. We did boat projects. We met a lot of other cruisers and had some fun. <clears throat> but the biggest, I think, aspect of this piece was it seemed like every week or every five days, we'd see some window coming. Oh, my God, look, there's like a couple, two, three, two day window we can get out of here. Three day window. And Des would send an email saying, oh, there's a, you know, there's this little window coming up. We got to keep track of it. There's a low that's hiding, but it might be okay and all this. And then he'll send another email and we're, now we're all getting excited. And send another email out saying, well, I've got nothing but bad news today. That low that I hope didn't come out is now coming up the coast. So you have to sit tight. And he would say things like, the bold and adventurous might want to go, but if you want to be bold another day, you might want to stick around. So we had that kind of, you know, sense of humor. <laughs> so anyway, we're on this roller coaster now of hope and then dashed hopes and frustrations. And then another window would come and we'd get our hopes dashed again. And the third window came around and um, we finally saw that we could probably do it. And Des put out an email saying, well, oh, sorry, that window I thought we were going to have really isn't going to happen anymore. So sit tight. <clears throat> and Mark and I were like, you know, maybe he's being just a little bit too overly cautious for us. And the bit that he was saying was not going to be acceptable was uh, some southwest winds like 12 to 15 knots coming up for maybe 12 hours on a three day or two, two night, three day passage from Richards Bay down to East London. And we said, you know, if it's only 15 knots and it's a short period of time and it looks like it's gonna be enough off the coast that we can scoot inside if we need to, to get out of any big waves if we confront any, um, let's just let's do it so this is what we before we got that des email everybody was looking for this tuesday departure monday we checked out and you have 36 hours to get out once you check out so we checked out on monday and we're now all psyched to leave on tuesday so monday afternoon we get this email from des saying no forget it don't go we said you know uh maybe as i just said so we said, okay, let's, let's do this. Let's get the groups tonight and then get them tomorrow morning. And then tomorrow morning, we'll make our final decision. By now we had fueled up, provisioned up. Uh, we were ready to go. And we saw that morning grib and we said, you know, it's just off the coast enough. It's not that bad. It's not that long. Let's just go for it. Let's get out of here. And it was great because I was starting to feel like, <coughs> starting to feel like um, the schedule was starting to, to slip enough that I might not be able to get all the way around to Cape Town. I might have to bail to get back for Christmas because I did want to spend some time exploring Cape Town and the Western Cape. I didn't want to cut that short. I'd already crossed most of the Indian Ocean, not officially to the very bottom, but I thought, you know, I could call it good. Uh, so I was very concerned about the schedule. So leaving then was, was a good thing. So this is just kind of an overview of the, the final sprints to the finish. We got Richards Bay up here, 330 miles down. You got Durban one spot, but as I said, nobody wants to go there. So 330 miles down to East London. And that's the biggest one because from here, there's small little hops around. Um, East London to Port Elizabeth is you know, one quick overnight. Uh, and then there's a, like a Nisna here and Mosul Bay here and Simons, a couple of other spots where you can pull in if you have to. Um, 
but this, once you got this one done, you're pretty much golden. Even if you got a lowest coming through every two days, you can find a one day to get to the next spot. So this was, <clears throat> this was the, um, uh, this was, what was this one? This is what it looked like the morning that we chose to leave Richards Bay. This was the system passing by. <clears throat> There's a little bit of uh, wind here that's going to become southwest right up the coast, but most of the system was heading off. So that's why we were feeling pretty confident that we could actually scoot down through here and make this happen. <clears throat> but this is what was happening just south of us and what we clearly didn't want to hug, hug the coast uh, any more closely to give us uh, more trouble. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, we did leave. Um, we took off on 11 o'clock that morning and a quick two day sail down. And on the way down, we uh, emailed Des and we said, do we qualify for bold and stupid um, by going off in this, <laughs> these conditions? And he, he emailed right back like within a couple of hours saying, no, you guys are doing it right. You, you, you made a good choice, good calculated risk. You paid your dues up front, and now you're just going to reap the rewards. So we felt really good about just getting the hell out of there. So a quick two days down to East London, and we arrived on Thanksgiving Day. So we were obviously giving much, many thanks. Um, and a lot of other cruisers there, of course, doing the same thing. Uh, the local yacht club had these little packets of like a little, a little steak, um, like a sausage, and a piece of chicken for like five bucks. And you take that package, you go over to these grills, you cook them yourself. And it was just really, really a lot of fun. And very, very, very grateful that we made it through. So uh, the next day we had a quick overnight to um, Port Elizabeth. Uh, that was a, a really nice little, um, very predictable one night window to get, get in and get out, get out and get in, uh, which worked out super. And so Port Elizabeth was the next spot that we thought, well, we've got four, five, six little <clears throat> day hops we can do if we need to. But obviously, we preferred to make one final sweep all the way around to, to Cape Town. Um, the, uh, what was that one? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. So on the, on the way in to Port Elizabeth, which is right here, about an hour, no, or 2 a.m. of that morning, uh, we get this grib, and I started looking at it, and Mark was just looking at me, waiting for me to realize that, oh my God, we can get to Cape Town. One more passage straight through, right around Cape Agulhas to Cape Town, because this whole system <coughs> was moving to the east, so this southerly wind here was going to be over here and we needed to let everything settle down just enough to get out. And then all of this big system over here was sweeping its way across and going to give us south and southeast. And it was going to wrap around with these winds just bringing us right into Cape Town. We were just so psyched. I was just like, oh my God, we can actually get all the way around. It was super. So off we went. We arrived in uh, at uh, we arrived at Port Elizabeth on I forget what day it was, but the, that morning, I think it was the second. Uh, that morning we got that that um, grib, and so we spent one full day there, and the next day we left because this all worked out perfectly. So we had just like two nights, one full day there, and out we went. And it was just another glorious sail, you know. Had that one lousy miserable section outside of reunion it was behind us now we had lots more good good sand a little cloudy but good wind and we finally got there the cape agulis is in the background in those clouds it's the the line where the indian ocean and the atlantic ocean meet and i was just so thrilled to actually get sail around that point it was just awesome 
And just continuing on an hour later, just now the winds are off to our, a quarter of the southeast and we're now heading kind of west northwest and working away northwest up the coast and it was just fantastic. And the next Go back day, to that last picture. I love that hat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, so the next morning, that two mornings later, well, the next after the last picture, uh, there's that dis, you know distinctive Table Mountain in the background. There's Hope Bay in the foreground, the entrance to Hope Bay on the right, Table Mountain at Cape Town in the background, and we were just very, very, very psyched. And this was the entrance, and the wind is starting to pick up as it kind of wraps around and tightens up around the the uh the, the landmass there and there was this little warning about staying like two miles offshore for some fish net something or other around the, around the bottom of the coast here so i'm a little overcompensating for that coupled with being so excited and taking all these pictures that i kind of overshot the entrance we had to actually beat our way in against increasing winds into hot bay so it was a little bit embarrassing, but it wasn't dangerous. It was just uncomfortable and only for like maybe a half an hour. And <laughs> those of you who read my, my little blurbs, uh, I probably think I had a piece in there about my sneakers, my boat shoes. I bought these things in Darwin. They lasted this, what, 6,000 some odd miles with a little bit of help and they made it all the way. And I think that the point here is not my sneakers, but the amount of abuse that everything takes on a passage like this. These boat shoes, I mean, what we did, the mileage we did is probably worth five to 10 years of, of coastal cruising in terms of your clothing being able to hold up. These shoes didn't make it. My um, shorts uh, uh, wore through in the ass and I had to use big sail uh, mending fabric to hold them together. Uh, and of course, I talked about lines you know, chafing through and all this stuff. Uh, it's just the abuse that everything takes on a passage like this is just incredible. You, you wonder why, but it just it just all adds up. Anyway, that's why those sneakers are there. That's boat shoes. So I come right into Hope Bay now. We're all set. Like so, exhaling, anticlimactic. We're exhausted, excited. You know all of those things. And after. All that time after that last round of Moscow Mules, <laughs> it's, it was time to bid adieu to Mark and Wavelength and go explore the Western Cape and have some fun there, a whole new experience. But it was just such, an, I think, maybe I said this before, it's so, we, we don't remember the bad stuff. So I kept saying how amazing this passage was because I forgot about those, you know, the really uncomfortable times. Um, but again, at this point, it was like the passage of a lifetime. We just, well, he's just now finished the circumnavigation. He arrived about four days ago in uh, Deltaville, Virginia. Um, so he's just finally finished his major accomplishment, which is just awesome. Anyway, so we the, are very, very psyched to get done. So and the boat is in Virginia now? Yes, it is. And Mark is in the Virginia? Okay, so yep. who did he sail up from South, South Africa from? Well, he had a crew from South Africa to Brazil, and they stopped at St. Helena, and then they went to Brazil, and in Brazil, they got to, the COVID had just started cranking up at that point. So he had, to, he was basically kicked out of Brazil. He said, you got to leave. We, you can't, we can't get on land here. Uh, his crew didn't have a visa to enter the U.S. She had to go back to wherever she came from. He had to leave, so he had to sail solo <clears throat> from Brazil to St. Thomas. Wow. And then uh, he was in St. Thomas for about a week. Uh, we had found uh, somebody that we didn't know, but a friend of a friend said, this guy is, is capable, he's a mechanic, he sailed a little some, he wants some experience. Mark went for it, and so we, he, that kid flew down, and he sailed with him from there up to Virginia. So we had a crew for that piece. But after I, I left, uh, I spent some time in Cape Town, then came around to Cape Agulhas here and spent a night or two here. And I just, this monument was just so fabulous uh, to me. I think it's just awesome. And that's, uh, the, behind me, it's this big relief map of, of Africa. And that's just leading down to that monument into the two oceans uh, border boundary. And this is, um, 
you know, south straight down to the, the border of the two oceans, the boundary of the two oceans, north, and here's the equator coming through the center of uh, the continent. And it's just a, an amazing installation. And there's the lighthouse at Cape Agulhas. <coughs> And this is just a quick, um, for, for me anyway, I always thought Cape of Good Hope was the, the place, uh, but it's not. The Cape Agulhas is where the oceans meet. Right at the bottom of this peninsula, uh, there's Cape Point on this side and Cape of Good Hope on this side and closing in False Bay. <coughs> so these are the relationships around those names that you keep here in Cape of Good Hope. And then, of course, is Cape Town right up here on Table Bay. Uh, so, and then here's Hope, Hope Bay is like right here. So it's basically a suburb of Cape Town. There's a big kind of mountains and stuff here, um, mountain hills, uh, big you know outcroppings and stuff. Uh, so, so where did you end up again? You you ended up down here at Cape Agulhas or up here right, at Cape Town? Right, right here at Hope, at Hope Bay, at right Cape Town. And then here's Robben Island, where Nelson Mandela spent all his years in prison. <clears throat> so um, that's that drill. And so here I am up on top of Lion's Head, Table Mountain behind me, uh, psyched to be there and having done this amazing thing. Uh, C'est fini. <laughs> all right, Chris, that's it. One, uh, one question before we open it up to, to more people, but came across. Uh -huh. um, you mentioned Indian Ocean traditionally considered the most challenging on circumnavigation. Is the Southern Ocean potentially more challenging? Is it not cited because it's not part of the usual route for circumnavigation? It, it's not part of it. Um, you, you don't have to go through, if you go through the canal, um, you don't have to go around the Horn. Um, if you did go around that way, that would, prob that would be the, the, probably the worst. But for most people to go through the canal, and I used to go from, from um, Australia up through the Red Sea and through the Suez Canal and the Med. <coughs> but, uh, but yeah, if, if, you did, if you did like around all the Great Capes, that would be definitely, several would be worse than that. Yeah, fair enough. Is it safe going up through the Suez Canal now? It's less dangerous. Um, I still wouldn't do it, um, but I keep hearing that it's getting a lot safer these days. Um, much of the piracy had moved down to, I think, Philippines area and, and Malaysia down that way. Still some down by the Comoros, um, but I think there, there was a lot of effort to open up the, Suez, the Red Sea and the Suez Canal. So that's getting Thanks. better. I think we're ready for questions. Anybody have any questions? Have to unmute yourself. How often did you use the roll of furling mane, the mast furler? Uh, uh, very often. Um, we didn't, um, we used the mane maybe 30, 40% of the time. It's hard to say, but it seemed to be we're mostly on the Genoa and the Mizzen or the Genoa and the, and the uh, Mizzen Stasel, the Genoa and the Mizzen. Several times we had all four white sails up and we were just like flying. Um, but, you know, whenever we had to, it was appropriate to use the main, we just roll it out and reef it back in infinitely. Uh, that was certainly a fantastic system. Uh, and it worked out, worked very well. What was your average speed, do you figure? I think our average is about overall about 160 miles a day, 165 overall. We had a, like a, I think a one 200 mile day, but we were always going five and a half to seven and a half knots. Uh, it was just great. Was there ever a moment where you said, um, don't want to keep going? Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, in, in fact, you know, having done several of these kinds of passages, uh, I was trying to mentally prepare myself for that <clears throat> that time of saying, I just want this over with. I just, I want to go home. I'm sick of this getting thrown around, getting beat up. Uh, it just sucks. And I knew that was going to happen. 
And it was just so amazing until that last bit over by you know, a couple of days at a reunion where I really, I was looking at my journal. And it's like, I just want this to be over with. Uh, I'm done. <laughs> and, you know, if I have to leave at, uh, at Richards Bay and go home, fine. In fact, I was, I was at a little, uh, I took a couple of days to go down to this um, reserve area and hang out. And I was on the phone with Heidi, I was on the phone with Mark, and I was, you know, if we don't get out of here soon, I'm just going to bail. And he said, yeah, no, he actually, I think he even said, if, if, if you need to bail, you know, so I started looking at airlines and stuff and said, God, I'm going to go home. <laughs> and I said, no, you can't. You got to stick with this. And I'm so grateful that I did. But yes, to answer the question, there were many, not many, several times where I was like, nope, I'm done. Get me out of here. <laughs> Any other questions out there? This is Patty. How did you get seasick? No, fortunately. Um, my general pattern is to take a two bonines uh, every morning before a passage. Uh, sometimes another one later in the day if I need to, but usually that just gets me over the hump and then I'm fine. If I have to stick my head upside down in the engine compartment, I'll get seasick. <laughs> but, but otherwise, no, gratefully. There was, one, there was one section, I was looking at some videos that I had taken and I was working my way through the, the interior of the boat from the V berth through the main saloon and up the steps to the co cockpit. And it was after, it was during a time when we were just rolling, just nonstop rolling. And, and um, I said, Michelle, how's it going? He said, yes, I'm sick of this motion, it's terrible. <laughs> and I, you know, I forget about that part, it was terrible, but it wasn't dangerous, it was just not fun, you know. So there were times like that for sure. Um, but fortunately, no seasickness. What'd you take for seasickness? What'd you take in the morning? You said to cut pills? Bonine. That, that works the best for me. I can't stand the patch. Um, and, that's the only, and I've done Sturger on a few times way back when we could get it from Canada, but now we can't even do that. Um, so bonine has been my go-to. It's always worked great. Dennis, that was really an amazing, amazing adventure. Thank you so much for sharing it with us and for your candor about, you know, the emotional part. Just amazing. Yeah, well, glad, glad to do it. It's, it's awfully fun to relive these moments, too, for me. So I'm glad you liked it. Where's next? Um, Penobscot Bay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, no more big passages on the horizon. Um, uh, if something comes up, it's going to be at least a year or two from now because um, I, Heidi let me go on this one longer than she had planned for. <laughs> What's the status with Gray Lady? Uh, she's going in on uh, next Wednesday. Um, have a little bit of an overheat problem I have to contend with. I just hooked up the water heater to the uh, coolant uh, cooling system. It hadn't been hooked up before. Uh, I know Craig, if, if your buddies that owned it prior to the last folks had any issue with that, but it seems to be working. I just need to get the air out, but everything else is done. I'm ready to go in, can't wait. Can't I'd be wait. glad to ask him. Send me an email if any questions you have. I uh, his boat is relatively close to mine in the marina, and I see him, uh, you know, starting in a couple of weeks, I'll see him uh, okay. relatively often. Cool. Will do. Thanks. What's the, on your tall rig for that sail, what, um, oh, you, you put the dimensions on there. I'm going to go check that and make sure that they do or, or don't fit. Uh, yeah, my mast is 58, well, it's 56 foot tall plus the, the uh, antennas. Yeah, that's about the same as mine, We're pretty, oh, pretty no. close. So I'll okay. check it out. Okay. I really, you know, Zoom is great. I'm glad we were able to do this, but it sure would have been fun just doing it, being more dialogue along the way. It was kind of odd <laughs> looking at my computer screen, I have to say. But it works, so it's cool. Yeah. Yeah, welcome to the new normal. Yeah, right. <laughs>
So yeah, we're, we're, we're planning to do this and to get together in person in the future. Yeah, I heard you say that. That's great. That's great. Dennis, it may be very strange to uh, do this to the computer, but you get to include people who are remote. Um, I'm in yeah. Colorado. Um, Alan Brothers, I think, is in Washington State. I suspect Barbara Goldberg's in Florida. So you, you get a, 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 an audience that's much broader by doing it through the computer. No, I, I appreciate that. That's, that's a really good point. And I, I, when I saw Chris's invite, I saw all these telephone numbers. Like and from here, you call this number here. And I said, where the hell is everybody? <laughs> We're everywhere. Now I get it. <laughs> well, I'm only in South Dartmouth, but I rarely make a meeting. And I'm thrilled that we are now recording them. Yeah, this is this Thank is great. Thank you. This is wonderful. Job. You guys in general do a great job. I'm, I'm uh, hooked up with a yacht club up here. Um, I've never experienced anything like what you guys got going for uh, connectivity. You know, among your among each other, it's just it's super. You do a great job. Well, your presentation was awesome. Thank you, Dennis. Well, thank you. And I can't wait for dim sum again. Yeah. Right. <laughs> We gotta wait till next winter, huh? Oh God. Uh, we'll be opened up by then. Chinese New Year. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Thank you again. Yeah, I'm gonna sign off. Yeah. Good night, everybody. Thank you. All right. Any Good other night. questions? <laughs> Otherwise, we appreciate Dennis that you came on. Come on to the next meeting next month and chat with people before the meeting. Um, everybody, especially there's still some guests on. You know, an awful lot of the real meeting starts, you know, by six o'clock or so where people gather for uh, adult beverage and just chat and then the meeting starts. Pizzas show up at seven, uh, 6 30 and then the meeting starts at seven. And the best part of the meeting is very often everybody chatting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. True. Sounds great. Be there. Uh, Craig, there's 